Welcome back to the Amazon EU Masters, where LDLC have suffered their first ever loss at this tournament to none other than Carmen Corp. And the turning point for all this was that last minute elder fight, which I'm here to break down. So I'm going to ask my production to roll in the clip for me. And as you can see, what is very important here is that Exekick is staying in the mid lane, trying to shove in the wave. That happens because LDLC want to have access from the top side of the map, because they know that from the bot side, Cabochat on this Camille is hanging about. So once this happens and Aika finds the kill onto Seiken, that means that LDLC can actually win this four versus five. But what Cabochat does here is he lures the entirety of LDLC away from the Elder Dragon. And once LDLC realizes, wait guys, the Elder the dragon is still going on. It's yoinked away from Karma Corp. Kabushat still baits them around. And look at the HP bars. Ragnar barely has any mana, 50% HP. Aika has completely run out of mana. And once the TPs come in and Karma Corp re engages the fight with the Elder Dragon, it's an absolute lost cause for the side of LDLC. And honestly, this was a misstep that was so uncharacteristic from the likes of LDLC. We've barely seen them make these kinds of mistakes. Yeah, and it really does feel like there's a lot of mistakes coming in from LDLC during this game, right? We look at the seven minute, 30 seconds at that second dra or at the dragon where we just kind of get LDLC watching the dragon being taken rather than looking for a cross map play up into the top side. And then you can see when they do eventually go for that play in top side, it completely falls apart as well. It just felt like LDLC really weren't thinking or making the correct decisions, which is what we've been praising for all tournament long. Exactly. It felt like, you know, maybe 13 is more unlucky than we <laughs> thought it was. They like, like, <laughs> lost their first game of the tournament here. And it comes down to, as you say, a, a lack of awareness of cross-map opportunities or a lack of willingness to take them and an inability to mechanically play some of the fights as well as they'd like to as well. And if we have a look back at some of the early plays in the game, you can actually see that whenever LDLC tried to do something, like Ragnar's getting caught out a little bit here but the reaction comes in and they're just putting bad after bad in a lot of these plays. Yeah, I mean, Ragnar knows he's dead, right? He's spamming his emotes, he knows he's out of the equation already. But this flash forward here to try and get the kill was just an absolute disaster. Like, there's no reason to try and invest this. Like, a kill onto Xin Zhao at this stage is not worth giving two kills across the Crabble Shard, especially with the late game scaling that LDLC had. Or sorry, with that Carmine Corp had. LDLC had no right giving this over. And you can see Cabot Shard just so far ahead at the 40 minute mark, a thousand gold ahead, was able to push up in his lane at that forward percentage at the bottom is how much of the early game he has passed the halfway mark of his lane. And 40% is a lot of the time to be pushed up. As soon as you get ahead on a pick like Camille, especially into the Gragas matchup where you scale so well as the game goes on, it becomes increasingly more difficult for LDLC to ever find an advantageous fight. And I feel like that is the truth indeed. But like what we're used to seeing from LDLC is lane dominance and I feel like their bot lane lacked that dominance especially in the very early game I felt like Dos even though he had a fantastic team fight later on his laning phase was just not there I don't know if it was miscommunication with him and his AD carry or with him and whoever he was attached on but it felt like the Yumi from anyone else was just so detached and I think a part of that was actually the change in play style we saw from Carmen yeah. Corp right yeah. like Oshin hit on it on the desk this was actually where we saw them translating that pressure from the top side to the bot lane. Yes, we did see Cabal Shard get a, lot of, a little bit of attention. He got that one gank. They got the play at Rift Herald. But the majority of the focus for 113 was on that bot side. And I think oh, like, that was the big difference maker. That early gank that we got really kind of threw a wrench into the work for X to kick and DOS, who'd already set up that way, lane quite well. And it just felt like from that point forward, that Reckless was going to be able to have so much more threat. And it's a big difference that we saw from their semi final against Vitality B, where we saw this jive and misfortune combo before, but they never actually gave the resources to Reckless. He fell completely by the wayside and was not a factor at all in those fights. And as much as Jarvan is a great ganker, having someone that can set him up yeah. for the gank helps so well, and Hantero and his Rakan continues to impress me throughout the course of this EU Masters. We will have a look at just how LDLC were able to strike back a little bit. A lot of it comes down to this play, Carmine Corp, perhaps overextending a little bit to try and kill Ragnar. I think Ragnar played the Gragas like a god this entire fight. He is the Camille, the second Cabo Shard lands down from his ultimate. He knocks away the Azir as he's about to dash, interrupting his E. And then from there on out, he was playing steadily. He gets another flash E onto the Azir, catching him off guard. And even though that's a huge misfortune ult, you've got Zinza right there who doesn't care because he pops his ultimate. And then ultimately, you're able as LDLC to run people down with the composition you have chosen because once that Yumi stays alive, then she can keep everyone else alive. Yeah, I also got to give a shout out to that Yumi because Doss's decision making in this fight was incredible. Like, 
completely understanding kind of the flow of the fight, like who he needed to be attached to at what point in time, who was fine to kind of let die because he needed to be in a different position. Das really made a big impact alongside Ragnar in that fight. Yeah, even though you don't have that many buttons to press a lot of the time as Yumi, you can still really impact a fight with who you're jumping onto, where you are. You saw he switched onto Ika, then he switched onto Exa Kick. It definitely helped LBLC out in that fight. But in the end, we did see Carmine Court coming out on top, and a lot of that comes around to how they played some of the mid-game team fights. Let's have a look again at one of these fights, uh, I think down towards the bottom side of the map, and explain to me exactly why it felt like LDLC, even if they found a good position, or oh, top side of the map, <laughs> even though they found a good position, could never really find exactly what they wanted. Yeah, I think it's just a really, again, kind of DOS coming it's into this as well with the ton of healing, a lot of pressure. But I think in this scenario, like where LDLC are able to pick up these fights, it's like, look at the rotations that we're seeing, the back and forth, right? You actually think, oh, well, Carmen Corp are in a position where they can set up with these ears, they can use the terrain, but you actually see that LDLC are using the terrain for themselves, backing away, constantly having this rotating front line that makes it really tough for Carmen Corp to finish off. Remember, an exit kick, fantastic flank here. Gets the uh, old straight across three members, absolutely wipes out Cabo Shard and sets this up beautifully. So I gotta say like Exa Kick has been playing these fights absolutely sublimely and kind of the person we've been highlighting at LDLC. Yeah, and as much as I said, LDLC kind of fell off as the game went on, they hadn't fallen off by this point. <laughs> <laughs> so they were still able to uh, to pick up the There's win in off. that fight. But as you can see, <laughs> you look towards the top lane, you look towards the mid lane, and that's really where the difference comes in in terms of scaling. Camille with four kills in the first 15 minutes of the game, obviously he's gonna have a big impact. But even in the mid lane, that Azir Seikin was just able to put out so much DPS and scaled so well into this fight. And he showed it last time in the semifinals when he played the Azir, right? He was the difference maker, turning around the game, getting these big shuffles. I feel like once you put the shoulders forward, the Zaya cannot move in too close to you because she's still wrong uh, short range, even when she wants to poke. So I feel like the Azir played a big role there. Reckless getting the resources, matching the damage from the Azir as well. You have three carries now in Kamakop. You shut one down, then you have another one remaining. You shut two down, then you have another one remaining. I feel like this is the Kamakop that we're used to seeing from even last uh, year. Yeah, and I felt like this was definitely a game that was Carmen Corp style, right? You get this big balloon lead in the early stage for Cabo Shard, and then you're able to run away with the game from us. I think coming into game number three, you're going to have to take a very different approach here coming through for LDLC, which is, you know, actually look for these cross map plays if you're going to play a mid game spiking composition. Make sure that you're not giving across these silly kills in the early stages to Cabo Shard. So he ends up with a four kill, Camille, and you just get outscaled to infinity. Like this just felt like silly mistakes from LDLC that meant that the game was too out of control for them to bring it back in the mid. Game. I mean, maybe the game wasn't in their control, though, because we have a, a veritable cursor amongst our mitts. Uh, Shakarez, he's a great guy. I love working it's with him time, on okay. the LEC, but he tweeted this during the game. LDLC really going for that 15-0, huh? Shaq, like, you curse the LEC enough, you curse international tournaments. Did you have to come and curse EU Masters as well? Apparently, he did. We're going to hand it over to our casters for game three of this series. You wonderful, beautiful gentlemen. Take it away. Wow. Thank you so much. He's never been that nice to me before. Yeah, it's because I'm here. I guess so. Yeah. Play by play as we look out for each other, you know? Also, you know, we coordinated with our with our outfits and, oh. and, and as, yeah, our, as our senpai, he went with the same but opposite, you know? I thrive <laughs> off of positive <laughs> affirmation. I'm positively glowing now. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be what? positive reinforcement. Honestly, there's another thing that just struck me. Our script lighters are getting incredibly lazy. Like, we have another brick in the wall as the song yeah. of the week, <laughs> and we have the blue wall taking <laughs> wins. Are you kidding me? You're not nice wrong, cause. actually. You're not wrong. You're not wrong with that one. But uh, again, great move there from Carmine Corp. LDLC, for the first time, like you mentioned, Nymera, they're going to have to adapt. And this is one of the big key words and key themes I'm noticing throughout this, you know, Amazon EU Masters tournament is that adapt. adapt uh, adapt adaptability. Oh my God! Adapt adaptability. <laughs> Thank I'll you. Do it for Thank you. you. You're best. You're the best. <laughs> but yes, that is going to be very key for either of these teams yes. to really come out with the full win. Well, and I, I do think that last draft was effectively the worst situation LDLC could have found themselves in. They were losing the sidelines, which is not something typically that they used to to that extent. They were outscaled in the five v five. Basically, no one has done that to them yet. And their bot lane was put under pressure when they normally like to just take them away from that limelight and allow them to come online a little later. I think a lot of things work against them and they still made it very, very close. Yeah, so I just feel like we're going to have a run back of the same draft we saw in game one because I feel like the bands that came through didn't really change. It was more the picks that Casey decided that he wanted to pick up instead now. So I'm still expecting LDLC, you know, get rid of the, the Seri, get rid of the Ari, or, sorry, Ari or Ari on the side of K-Cop, of course, to rise, and then the Saya coming through as the third band as well from LDLC. Adaptability. 
Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm proud of you. You, you did well. Thank oh, you. Oh, here, really uh, adaptability that. keyword already coming through. Third ban is not going to be the Orn this time around. It's actually going to be the Aphelios. So if you ban hmm. out the uh, Sire to come through here, it just leave open some more potential in the Misfortune as well for Reckless once again, uh, or another AD carry. And we talked quite early into that second draft because the MF came in quite early into that second draft. How important that was for Carbon Core because it allowed them to play more towards that bot side, play more aggressive in lane, use that brawn, which we know that Reckless and Terra can do in a 2v2, and that's the champion that they've really shown it on. So not having the Aphelios on the table, which is kind of the catch-all in terms of I hit level 6, you can't really interact with me, it hurts Carmine Core taking off the table. I think that's a good adaptation as we we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And for Carmine Core, they're going to go highlight themselves and say, look, 113 needs to be on something that can be aggressive early, can get those lanes going. I will say, definitely a bit shaky in some of those smites in game uh, number two, but still got the result. and still had some very good moves coming into those first 10 minutes. And it also gives you a way to facilitate the early game. They tried the volley bear, didn't really like it. Seems like the flag and drag for that extra range is what they really needed on the side of 1 run 3 to get the lanes going. I feel like Exekick and DOS this time around will have to pay a bit safer, especially on the first three waves around that laning phase, because it was certainly something that really put k -Corp in a favorable position from the get-go, the fact that they overstepped on the first three waves. But now we're looking at Yai going back towards the Jinzao, and as someone who has prioritized something like the Viego a lot, this has kind of been the fallback champion in terms of like you still have early pressure, you still have a lot of agency when it comes to the team fights as well. And in that last game, Yike, with that Yumi on top of them, was a huge threat in those team fights. It is a lot harder to execute on them. You need to be hitting a lot of those Ws. You need to be making sure that those E's, when you take them in, they're in exactly the right place. Otherwise, you get blown up and you don't have that same level of safety you used to have. Of course, that ultimate cooled out, uh, duration was uh, cut down a bit. Not as safe a champion as they were through the rest of spring. And it feels like this is just going to be a run back, right? I wonder if Casey is not picking the AD carry here. The AD carry pool will just be trimmed. Wouldn't surprise me if you see Reckless once again be like, okay, I'm going to go Misfortune. We already have Javan on our side, so I don't really have to be worried about someone coming down bot. Um, but they're actually going to prioritize once again Hatara and Disrakan. And remember, this guy, much risk performances, right? We saw it against Vitality B. We saw it in this set game as well, where he was the one who was out to roam first. That is something that's really pivotal for K-Corp when they need to get their game going. Now, I spy with my little eye on my prep sheet down here. Uh, uh -huh. There's not many AD carries for Exa Kick down there. And actually, in fact, there are only three of them, and all three of them are currently banned. So they played the Aphelios, they played the Zeri, and they played the Zaya. They need to play something else. With that Yumi locked in, there's going to be bans thrown down there, and you're going to start seeing the AD carry ball, which has been pretty constrained in this tournament, broken open a bit. Here's the thing, though. If K-Cop starts banning away the AD carry, they're also limiting their own pool yep, as well, exactly. right? So it's like, yeah, you can start banning these AD carries, but pool is still decently wife. I wonder if we're, we're even going to be defaulting, you know, to the likes of Kaiser again, or the likes of, like, Tristana, if you want to jump in there, if you, you really want to get these long range going, the more you scale into the game as well. Caitlyn could be an option as well, but then again, with Yumi, not really the, the strongest pickup either. I've seen a couple of Varus Yumi's through the split, True. Uh, and I'm thinking also a Go Rogue, which was the real out there AD carry kind of team. They played stuff like Twitch. Now, I wouldn't play Twitch in my life into Azir, Javan, and Rakan, but it's still an option. And you're you not a pro player. And I'm not a pro player for very good reason. I'm also a mid laner. I wouldn't be picking any of those champions. Yeah, absolutely not. But we are going to see the, like not you very said, adaptable. Not <laughs> I play Ari with one skin, Ari with another skin. You see, it's very adaptable. Yeah, I'm so it happy it's banned today. For it. I know, right? It's been banned. Permaban because of how easy, how high of a priority yes. it is. And another high priority has been that Orn has been permanently taken off the board. And we are going to see LDLC and Garmin Corp singing from the same hymn sheet of saying, look, bot lane's already been constrained a little bit. We need to focus on the top side, but that Jinx ban is very interesting for me on the side of LDLC because it means they are still looking to try and get some kind of priority. I wonder what position you're looking for here because yes, you could ban away the Scion, but then still I think LDLC, they're looking for an AD carry pick. They want to go five. And if you leave open the Scion, then you can pick it up yourself. You already have like really good backline carry in the Aesir. You know you're going to be having a carry in Reckless. Why not just be building on some frontline instead then? The only thing with that then is that they're losing a little bit of what you talked about, the side lane presence, but you can only do so much when you have to blind pick. And they're hovering a few, a couple of things. Of course, over Yumi's history, been paired up with a lot of different things. Seen the Ezreal get banned away. It's going to be the Jin put in. So this is going to be a lot of setup. And when you have, again, quite a high mobile, high mobility team, very high burst damage between Jin Zhao and that LeBlanc. If you ever get priority in bot lane and you get to push up beyond that wave, and it's a little harder with the Yumi, but the Jin kind of helps you get that. You black out that bottom half of the map. You start firing these Ws out of Fog of War. Actually, very difficult for Kami Core to play safely after that point. And, and once again, blind pick a Jin here is still going to be nice for Misfortune. It's kind of the yeah. same idea that went into the Desire, except this time around, it's no 
you know, self peel in the likes of a Jin. You get caught by a slow, by Jarvan coming down there. This bot lane already is incredibly difficult to pilot. If you mess up one time as Exa Kick and Doss here, you will continuously get ganged and dope. And the big thing for Carmen Corp is you look at this draft versus their game two draft, it's almost identical. The only thing they couldn't take was the Camille because it was banned in the second oh, yeah. round. So they've got themselves a NAR equally good at just setting that kind of you know, big team fight ultimate, maybe try and find a back line with the hop. And it looks like it's going to be on LDLC to be the proactive ones, to find something going for them either in mid or in top, or like we said in the last game, getting that Yumi on top of that Xin Zhao and moving around the map to get advantage. Now, before that chase was locked in, I thought LDLC would have a really hard time again as soon as you start grouping more people together. Now, you actually do have a range advantage, which is really difficult oh, yeah. to get over a misfortune than a zip because they're that long range. But now you have the accelerator shock blast. There's no sustain on the other side to really deal with that as well. Yeah, you've got an eclipse on the misfortune at some point, but it's not really going to work when you're in river. You don't have a minion wave to start hitting up on. And if you ever slip once in the grouped up fights now as Kami Core, that W from Jin lands. The shock blast lands. A lot of burst follows up. I think LDLC have a lot of good pick as soon as you start putting pieces together. That's the thing. They need to be the, on the objective and try, you know, poke them down before the fight even starts. So they come to a point where it's like, oh, we're too low HP to actually fight this one. We'll just have to forfeit the objective instead. And even Ike will be able to do that on, that on the LeBlanc. W for Q R E. That's poke in itself, right? You never have to be the. You never have to one shot them. You just have to make sure that they're not in a position to take the fight. Yeah, and that's the big thing as well. Yes, you have a lot of poke. You've got a lot of range available to you on the side of LDLC, but you aren't the masters of your own engage. You're kind of waiting to see what comes in on top of you and if you can survive it. But in fairness to them, yes, they lost in game two. They were able to find some decent points of the fights where they were able to kind of survive that initial engage, survive the, the range advantage that you have with the Azir and the Misfortune and still come out on top. Yeah, now, to kind of phrase it fairly to LDLC, again, they were still ahead in that second game. Even with all of these factors working against them, I said, actually, typically as a team, LDLC, they don't like XYZ. Maybe this is bad for them. They were still very much in a position to have won that game and it got very, very close around the Elder fight. Now, in this game, I think the LDLC have to play a very different style of League of Legends. Again, it's more poke. I think if you get vision around the area of the objective as well, someone is walking to it. Someone like an Azir, they get caught by a Jin W, they are in a massive amount of threat. You can hop over walls. I think that LDLC are gonna have to show a lot of different skill sets that we haven't seen from this competi uh, com uh, competition yet. Look how much prior they're putting onto Rakhna in the early game though here. They come up with Yumi, they place a pink board because Yumi doesn't really have to buy potions either way. And now he's got, you know, facilitation in the early game. That means Yike can even go red buff and go out on top lane immediately just to come in with a cheesy level 2 gang if that's what he wants. And we gotta talk about this top lane as well. Both games, we saw these two top laners kind of taking themselves apart, you know, to be the to be the boss, to be the final raid master of these particular teams. And for Ragnar versus Cabo Shard, it has just been about them facilitating the the team and what they want to do as a team. And again, we've talked a lot about these bot lanes in regards to the rest of the map. And you can see right there, jungle proximity, large amount of pressure for Cabo Shard from his jungler. Also happens from support. Hans Hero makes their way up there. Both of these players are so very important to their teams. Wait to see exactly where they want to try and focus out now as LDLC. There we go. We see both junglers on the bot side here as uh, 113 and Yike have out. Both had fairly decent early games when they were both on the jar, but I'm curious to see where 113 does go because no real vision was actually established by either team to be aggressive. So both teams are kind of in a little bit of a blind spot when it comes to the junglers. But let's try and, you know, go back to what we saw as well in, in, in just the second game as well, where we saw the matchup with the LeBlanc into the Asir. Remember, Ica was actually really good at being the one getting that priority. And with this priority, well, well, let's try and fast forward that a little bit. Let's try and predict, once you have that mid lane priority, once you can build that up towards the top side, where, you know, it's already dropped the pink ward, you will have your jungler pathing up towards the top side as well. You might just be looking for wave three, wave four play on the top side. Just see if you can pro Cabo out of the game uh, so early into uh, which was what we saw in the first game. Ooh, early all in. Ooh, they have to flash away there, and that's kind of what we wanted to expect to see from Hantera. Again, very aggressive on this. Rakan wants to try and get those early summers and out. You need to do this versus Yumi. You need to start punishing level one, level two before there are multiple points coming through, and you have a lot of power from something like an Ignite to force an all in. I'm not sure it achieves that much here, though. I'm actually so surprised that I see that 113 is pathing up towards that top side. I think it can only be to shadow Cabochon in the beginning to kind of stop them from going on a dive there initially. Because once again, we see how difficult this bot lane is to play. That's why I highlighted it in Champ Select 2. Because you make one mistake, you're dead. And now, Exekick, he doesn't have that flash. So oh, 113, they spot him. if he disrupt this, get the reset through, moves down towards the bottom side, they are in a really good position on K-Corp. 
Okay, Cabo doesn't have rage. Mid lane is in priority for Saken, though. Gets to push it in. So 1-1-3 uh, does the full clear, gets that one scuttle, and if Yike goes up towards the, those Krugs, of course, I mean, that bot lane doesn't have that flash. I'm not sure LDLC would really want to fight towards a bot scuttle. No, they do not want to fight towards it. Ike uh, just taking a favorable trade into Saken, recognizing there isn't a lot, if any at all, mana on top of this Azir, so able to take that one there. 1-1-3 one, one, is... Uh, Burning straight down towards his bot side, so he wants to try and make something work out to Exit Kick, who does not have Flash, but this is smart from LDLC's bot lane. They know they can't really push this far forward, and they have to back away. Yeah, so at least they get the crash. I was wondering if that wave stave was a potential freeze for K uh, for Reckless and Hantara. Luckily, they are able to get the crash through from Exit Kick, and Dosta allows them to get a favorable reset, and the wave stave won't be too messy for them. If they had been stopped there, their lane would have been really disastrous. And actually, both of these bot lanes throughout this one have been doing those uh, those quirky um, bot lane shenanigans where uh, the what they'll fake a recall, or they'll shove it in, or they'll have the support just walk up and uh, start uh, proxying that way. Not proxying it, but you know, like start holding it at a certain exactly. point outside the town. Both of these lanes have done that. They're both wise to each other's tricks. Tara, though, yeah. this is early roaming, and he can W over the wall, come through from the tri-bush if he wants to. Not going to opt into it. Obviously, it would be a bit dangerous if you just W in and yikes on the other side, right? Uh, but outside of that, once again, displaying how heavy they value getting Hantara on the map, and specifically on the Rakan pick. And in this 2v2 as well, I mean, you leave the Misfortune alone against the Zero, I mean, you're not going to have a Leona or a Nautilus hooking that Misfortune, putting them into a lot of threat. It's more than okay for them to do this in the 2v2. And one of my issues with picking the Yumi up for LDLC is actually, again, we talked about it so much in Game 1, which LDLC really ended up smashing out. Yike and Doss has been so important for this team. The Yumi stops them playing around that quite as much. Now, it does have a lot of value in those team fights. don't get me wrong. I just think for LDLC, you need to play the early game so much more differently without Doss being on a big roaming champion. You're right, and that difference obviously has to come through some skirmishing through Yike as well. They never really accelerated the dueling potential you get into a Javan. They never really invaded on Raptors either with the Yumi, with the LeBlanc as well. So I feel like if you want to make this kind of pick combo work with Yumi and, and, and Sensao here, well, you, you have to start skirmishing. You have to get ahead of the opponent's jungler. This is what he's trying to do right now, to Sneaking himself into some alcove gameplay. Sitting himself nice and snugly in between those two walls as this wave is just being pushed in. It is just kind of a hover right now, expecting 113 to kind of be in a position, but they are starting to push a little bit further ahead as 113 finally puts himself now towards this bot side. Yike will be revealed as uh, the Jarvan and him cross paths and Execute backs himself away. But the response is there immediately for 113, and they don't get the crash. Now the threes is there outside of the bot line lane. It's a Karen with minion as well, which really puts Execute in an unfavorable position where he'll just have to forfeit minion waves. This entire wave now, it's no longer his. And Reckless by default, because of minion paro, because of the lane matchup, just gets an, an advantage. And again, just speaking about LDLC, in the few flaws they really have shown, and remember, they were undefeated up until that last game, but there were a couple of worries when the, when the game became very bot lane centric when there was a lot of impact put down there when there was a lot of ability to play oh. around those tricky lane states they're Big gonna trade. get a lot of damage here ragnar will be able to trade it back though into his range form one more auto attack oh. from either of these top laners would have done it neither using their flash yike is here though and 113 is not cabo shard is trying to heal up as much as he can he's exhausted for a little bit so won't be able to get up his mega it's a bit of a weird one right now. You know don't. It's coming. It knows oh, it's coming. Oh, hits. the accelerated shock blast does land. Ragnar's trying to see if he can make something work for himself. He's trying to see if they can get on top of him. The good flash, the knock up is good. Yeah, he can't finish it, but Ragnar can. And that's first blood going up to the top side. And that is so important, but what can one with three clean up? No, he can't. Execute. execute. Yeah, execute is good. Execute and execute. And that's going to be 113 finding literally nothing right now. As Antera feels like he can get something going from sides on the bot side. They drop down the Ignite, but Doss is there just to absorb so much of that damage. It is very big, though, that there's nothing actually retained by Kami Core on that top side. They don't get to clean anything up. There's no extra gold going into that Jarvan. And now with that Jace getting far ahead, we brought up, you know, the whole thing about this top lane. Kabashop being so dominant in that last game. Game before that, Ragnar on the side, so important to their team. In this game, with the Jace getting ahead of the Gnar early on, getting a kill, getting to crash a wave, it's huge value for LDLC. Yeah, and it's exactly what they wanted. We knew it from the get-go when we walked in. That pink wall drop, that pathing from the bot side going up there as well. And from Capo, a ah, little bit too over-aggressive. You win a really good trade, like the trading pattern initially is so good. If you could get a recall where the wave state will kind of just by default stop out of sight of your turret, you'd be great. But he wanted to go in for it. He saw the potential solo kill, and because of that, well, he gets punished while Yike finally comes around. 
And this is just a very unfortunate. I feel like if he he probably survives if this accelerated shock blast does not gets land. Close. It gets very it's very very close. very close right there because you can see how low everyone goes and he almost outplays it. But I gotta love the fact that Yike had got that knock up already prepped and primed and was ready to try and go in. So he knew as soon as he got on top of him, he was dead. Yeah, actually uses the auto attack on the tower to start priming that three talent strike, the Q, and, and gets out with enough time. And one more three just has to watch and go ah seconds away from getting a huge advantage for topside. But despite that, it is actually KCOP securing the Rift Herald, and that is something you would have loved on LDLC. If you could have accelerated your side lane leads with Shelly here, would have been absolutely pivotal. But now with mid lane priority, Saken hovering on the left side of the map, KCOP as well with Rift Herald, could just employ this on the top side if they'd like to. So what was... Oh no! Oh, I was just about to talk about that pink ward surviving so long. Actually, I believe it was Ragnar who actually replaced it, so it wasn't the original pink ward. I was baited myself there, but mid lane. Um, I can take as well hard trades with Hantera, uh, taking a field trip once again outside of his lane. Well, we're going to see some hard trades on the top side here as there goes the Cataclysm there. Cabal Shard not quite in Mega, and they can't really dive this one just yet. Yike doesn't have the Flash. He does get the Tree Talon Strike. They don't land the Boomerang to get the reset here, and Cabal Shard's just dead. Nothing he can do, and this is starting to become a bit of a theme right now of Carmine Corp just overextending. Exactly. Another overextension from Cabal Shard. They didn't have the roaming coming through from Hantera up to the top side. He was in the mid lane trying to facilitate that. Oh, the chain. Oh, they're going to get a double knockup here into another double knockup as Dawson and Yike need to try and back themselves away. Ike will get a chain down to stop Saken from joining the party. And this is starting to get a little bit scrappy here, Nymera. Those are some really clutch chains, though. You may, you miss one of them suddenly. Carmen Core maybe feel emboldened to not fight around him. However, they do enough work <laughs> to stop the Herald going forward. This is going to get a little bit dicey here. They will only get two plates and, and it goes straight. Both go yeah. to one, one, three. That is so annoying. That is so annoying. Here we go. They're going to get the flash out of Ike, but they get the ult traded back from Saken. It was Ignite from DOS. And again, it's just very scrappy coming out here from both teams. Lots of someone to burn there, but they don't actually secure the kill. So Saken all he had to do use the ultimate, and he's fine. Definitely a worth scenario. This time around, though, the Drake, it's been taking a while for them to secure this objective. We're 10 minutes into the game. Usually we would see it be contested at around the six to seven minute era. This time around for both teams haven't really been a priority, and it just speaks to how much the top lane has been about this game. And you think back to other LeBlancs we see in the series and, and these kind of compositions where you don't have uh, an Aphelios, a uh, Zaya, something which really scales up. LDLC are on a point where they do actually value that gold over those neutral objectives. Now, Jace is a bit of a weird factor in that because Jace always loves stacking st uh, stack dragons. You force them to come to the objective. Jace pokes you out with those oh, yeah. item spikes. But in this particular game, I mean, I think LDLC are very happy with just getting some wins around topside. I think that's uh, something that they were very, uh, it was very important for them to get and they've managed to achieve that. Now we start to see some more shifts coming around. We do have the turbo chem tank being finished up here by 113, so he's got some decent tanky sats to him, but it is equaled on the other side by Ragnar on that Eclipse. So they are pushing this one in. They will get Hantera and Saken back over the wall. And that's the final chapter down. So we're seeing a lot of very, very different from game one and even game two, where there was an awful lot more structured 5v5s. It's more seems to be odd number of skirmishes coming around the, all these different But objectives. at least they're trying around it this time around. This is something we didn't see in the first game. Now the execution is not really hitting, but this is how you want to play it. But it just speaks to the good disruption you see from k -Corp as well. They immediately, as a unit, both just used their mobility and dashes to get into the pit and get out of the scrap. And uh, it's really sad that they didn't quite get that uh, final chapter down onto both of those uh, very, very high mobility champions. Reckless uh, throwing that all on the top 10. Sadly takes aggro. Maybe would have been able to force X kick a little off and <laughs> trading ultimates. Trading ultimates. One lands. Will he get the fourth? He will not. That's just going to be a little bit of trade, but important to notice, Exekick did lose his heal off of that, so a tool not available. And Dragon's still yet to be started or even looked at right now, Goldberg. Yeah, but honestly, bot lane is completely fine from how much this has gone. It could have been punished way more, especially with Exekick not having Flash in the early game. So I think he's fine with it. He just needs to be that old bot that facilitates Ragnar and Exekick later into the game. Even Yike if he dashes in with DOS. And that's kind of what we're waiting for. So once again, LDLC, I think they're in a position where they don't ever want to start up the Drake. They want to wait for them to just play around the top side. And if k is not picking up this Drake by themselves. Well, LDLC, they're going to be scaling. They're going to be getting Ragnar ahead. That's exactly what they want. Okay, now we see Hantera on the top side, as they always are, but Saken and 113 are joining the party. We'll see. We're going to get Corralled just yet. And it's another wave and another 
period of play which the Jace has been protected in. Because Jace, even when you get individual advantages, can always be shut down. Hasn't yeah. reached that two item spike yet. When he gets really annoying, when he just one shots you when you try and go onto him. Usually not three. Yeah, when you get to those three items, you think, okay, that's a little bit difficult. Not nearly at that point yet, though. And most of the time, LDLC do this for their mid lane, right? Again, they protect the mid lane very well. In this game, it's been that top lane. And they're showing those transferable skill shots, uh, skill, uh, skill sets. And they're just making sure Cabo Shard's having a really bad time. Cabo Shard is kind of needs to back away from this. He had no vision to see if they actually came in on top of this. And they know he didn't walk away. He actually just TP back to the lane. 113 finally recognizing that something's going on. Cabo trying to get up to his mega as soon as he possibly can. And LDLC recognize they do not want anything to do with this fight. But they get the plating once again. And they get the pressure from Ragnar. And they can do this. They're not getting punished on any other side of the map. Yikes still up a level as well against 113. Which is what we wanted to see in Cabo. Oh no, mate. You're not going to be able to extend it again, right? Oh, final chapter comes out. He gets locked in. They will get the knockback. Can he keep, keep himself alive? He cannot, and the teleport comes out from Saken as well. Carmen Carp, you gotta dot your eyes, you gotta cross your T's! And you can't even look to respond to that. You think, oh, we've burned some flashes. Well, yeah, they're still full HP. They still have a Yumi. They still got the Crescent Guard. No ability to really play around this. And the more these fights happen, the more I think, this just gets better and better for LDLC. Now, Dizir is going to be a problem later on to the game. Yeah, the Misfortune is going to be a problem, but with the Jace getting all of this gold, with Cabo, who was a big part of Calming Core in that last game, being 0-3, it just feels like it's starting to get very difficult for Calming Core. Well, issue though, right? Because we already talked about the range discrepancy that there is in this matchup, the Shot Glass to come through, the Poke as well from Ica. It's going to be very difficult for Rectus to set up a proper engage to come through. Some of that will come through the creativity we often see from Saking on the AC at 113. But once again, if LDLC plays it correctly and they are playing around the range, but well, they should be in a more favorable position come these fights. Finally, LDLC finally saying, look, we can take some time. Now the plates are gone to look towards this dragon. But even then, 113 still there. And Ooh, it's a lot of damage. They will land Reckless onto the stone. He does have a bit of movement speed. Will miss two, three, and possibly a fourth shot will go completely awry. And now with the dragon down, does go over the side of LDLC. It was a delaying ultimate. I love the theory crafting here. Oh, it was a little bit of a delaying like ultimate. Your optimism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go, you know what? Not a lot happened, so I'm gonna go with you on this one, Nightmare. I'm gonna keep a <laughs> blind optimism and how that one works. Oh, teleport behind. Let's get some action in, boys. Let's make it happen. They're gonna try and look for it here. I can to be careful, though, as he's gonna get jumped on straight away, and he's gonna get taken into his passive already. They don't have a gin ultimate, so they can't go for a long-range engage. Exit kick will have to use his flash to keep himself safe. The bullet time is good. The charm almost lands onto the key carries, but Antara dies. And while that's been happening on the picture in picture, Cabo Shark gets a solo kill. How in the hell does Cabo get a solo kill on the top side when he's died three times and Rakn has been getting oh, all the reasons? Oh, no. oh, thank God he flashed. He's all right. He's going to be Ooh. fine. He's going to be fine. They will eventually get the reset off here. And that's the power of the Yumi. Doesn't matter how low Ica goes in, he's going to be able to come back. And we went for very quiet. Let's talk about the theory crafting, the optimism too. Okay, let's throw everything in the kitchen sink at them. Okay, so we talked about Chase is still easy to shut down until he gets to one shot you. This is level 11. It's still the second tier of the ultimate. Not has such high base damages, particularly in that mega. And then gets to chase down and. Ragnar walks into a brush without vision, and that's all it takes sometimes to just shut down a Jace. Jace is a very difficult champion to pilot, even from ahead. You need to be so respectful. Ragnar just lets it slip for one moment. That's the thing. Essentially, right out, especially after the change is coming through, he's still a you know range champion. Those space that yes, they favor the melee, but you're building full lethality. You get matched up against the now with Trinity Force. Those that, that damage, it will just start to come through. We're waiting for that three item power spike before he really becomes a menace, and then once again, K Corp somehow manages to sneak away a Rift Hell on the top side, despite LDLC being the one who's really come out ahead on the skirmishes on this side of the map. The important thing is, as you said, they did come out on the skirmishes up until that solo kill on top, sadly. Is, is it a skirmish so, yeah. if it's only two people? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's still a skirmish. It's still a skirmish, but it does mean that you have the full control. You can see the vision control there for Carmine Corp. Meant they felt very confident going for that objective. You even have the level 11 for Reckless. That means that his bullet time is going to be shredding through people. And now you're going to start making work onto Hantera, who's going to lose Ow. his... Excuse me, he's going to lose his uh, stopwatch, and now with the Rift Hell being put onto top lane, I actually don't think this will get a charge off because you got everyone here. Yeah, they're going to have to burn this one down. Oh, You're not going to get to get it. That's really sad because that would have either taken that top lane turret. We know that again. Chase, even though they're dying, have a lot of gold put into them. Could have also been an easy route into mid. I'm actually looking to trade on the notes of that, but uh, 
Coming Corp, at least going to be able to take the mid outer. It's not the best trade for them, losing that Herald, but at least they still start to open up the map, and it gives them the ability to group up a bit more now. And I love how even this game is in terms of the team's different win condition, right? On the top side, I was LDLC coming out on top. Cabochard, obviously, being a little more of a threat after he got that solo kill and has started to push in on the top side as well. But it's just like the game in gold is so even, and it's come on different things, like Reckless down towards the bot side getting priority, mid lane taking with the first Herald charts getting it. And it's just blow for blow, and punch for punch, hit for hit, whatever synonym, synonym you want to throw in there. But it, this time around, Kcop, they should be able to break the top turret. And it comes down to execution. We talked about this last time as well. It's like, yes, you've got different tools available to you, but it's how you execute with those tools that we're going to see Carmine Corp take away the dragon, uh, excuse me, the dragon, the top lane turret, and then back themselves away. They know they're at a pretty powerful spike, and they're trying to make the most out of that. And the spike is happening at a very even point in the game, and I do think LDLC have largely been the, the best team in this tournament at playing around. Very specific spikes for their teams. But this oh, is yeah. the finals. Things change in a finals best of five. They especially change when you're up against the back-to-back -back champions of said finals. In Kamin Court, you know, I, I was one of these people that doubted them pretty much most of the event. I thought plans, they were looking a bit shaky. Groups, they had a lot of those problems again. But they've continued to build and coming to these finals. It's feeling very close. But it also goes down to the level of players we have here, right? You know, we got veterans coming through and it seems like they kind of just evolved with the state of the tournament as well. And I, I know an issue for them in the beginning as well and why LFL was so tricky for them was that it was motivational issues. Like a player like Reckless who's been sitting in a studio, all of a sudden he's sitting at home playing a game that has high stakes, but it's really difficult to get into the mindset that it does have these high stakes. Now you finally get into one of the bigger tournaments. Now you get to European Masters, you start playing the finals and you start feeling that motivation to do well, to get yourself back in the LEC, which for a lot of these players in K-Corp, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and that's the big thing as well. I think K-Corp, again, they're not an academy roster. They are not a team that's looking to quote unquote develop no, behind a second jewel. team. This is this is their grand jewel. This is where they want to make their bread and butter as they make their way down towards this bot side. Ike, very slippery, but is starting to run down a little bit on the Seiken. And Seiken, honestly, throughout this main event has gone. Okay, with people like Cabo Shard and Reckless that you mentioned, Seiken has been someone that I've just been keeping my eye on so much because on this Azir specifically, he's been able to pump out absolutely ridiculous damage numbers. He might be able to do some of that coming up to a fight in here. Yike, trying to predict something or other coming out of that, but uh, just eating some skill shots for it. But for me, last last tournament, I actually thought Cabo Shard was very much my player in the tournament before the finals even started. This time around, I'm very much indecisive. Let's see if anyone can here make that work. The long gauge, wrong rage engage with the Jin comes in. They Get the final chapter and the Crescent Guard. That's a lot of ultimates burned here. And 113 is still alive. You didn't even burn any summoners here from the side of K Corp. You are still seeing if you can make this 5v5 work. Cabo Shard is up into the Mega and he will lose that in the next five or six seconds. So, Carmine Corp are in an opportunity here where LDLC are going to be a little bit ham fisted to try and make something work. We will see the flash burn by Saking as he goes a little bit too far forward. Cabo Shard has to hop out because he knows he's about to go mini and the dragon can be started here by LDLC. That was actually a really high value chin trap. As soon as you get that slow on Saken, W's fly through the air. Oh, heck, got a flash out. And LDLC, they actually get to the objective first this time and they find they make it very hard for... Oh, gosh, that's damage. Oh, that's a lot of damage coming in there. But the heal, the flash, and the Gale Force used means extra kick just keeps his life. Excluding what we just saw, that was a very beautiful fight from LDLC, and they kind of piloted the composition exactly how we wanted them to. It's not about finding any kills, but it's about making your opponent so low that they cannot fight. That's what they did. They're able to pick up the Drake. Yes, it's a little messy on the exit, but outside of that, that's how you wanted to function, and you already picked up two Drakes. Oh, they're looking for a has the flash, has Mega coming. They've got Mega coming in, but he's not going to be able to use it in time. Just gets deleted because he has no magic resistance. Yeah, and you know what the uh, prime suspect is? There's an item down there. That hurts quite badly. It's been evolved at this point. And Ragnar, with that Muramana transform, we said it's going to be a problem when you reach those three items. Starting to get a little help to get to that point. And Keiko. Nothing else they can get on the map. They're only left to shop lanes right now. On the top side, you already broke the turret mid lane as well. You only really have to take this bot lane turret away, uh, uh, away from you. And it feels like that's been the game as well. You know, K-Cup, they've been very good at trimming out these turrets. There's still turrets to be taken from the side of LDLC. But when it comes to the skirmishes, that's where we see their crop flourish. And I feel like K-Cup, we see them on the rotations. We see them when they're pressuring people, when they're isolated. Um, and it's still going to be, once again, a tit-for-tit, tat-for-tat between these two teams. And I love the way you said that as well, the isolated members of the side of K-Corp, because you look at the deaths, if you consider this game. Yes, it's one of five, but four of those deaths are onto the NAR. Cabo Shard has been isolated because he has to be on the sideline. He has to be the one to deal with the Jays. He's the only one who can tank the poke and with the fleet footwork going in, trying, you know, 
heal it back up. So it is going to be a lot more in him. I still think he's having a decent game. We obviously saw that solo kill that kind of brought it back up, but it is still oh. going to be on him. They get the flash in onto the Cataclysm, but with nowhere to go, shutdown goes over to Reckless, and that's the combination. You guys mentioned it in Champs Select. When this Jin doesn't have flash, he's a sitting duck. I and I pick. know it feels so bad to say, oh, you got to play safer and mid. He's not even stood that far up. It's just the nature of this comp. It's the nature of that combo. Jarvan has the access. You have that bullet time to just really punish them. Next kick has no help in that situation. Oh, oh, teleport. They're gonna go for something here. They do have a flash and a ultimate here from Cabo. Can he look for something? Not before he goes into the mini. But now, oh, Seiken so goes in, gets them scooped and booped. Ike trying to get away from this, oh. but Hantera is heat seeking. He knows which one you are, and he's going to find you now. It's onto Ragnar, who needs to try and stop this Baron. And when you reach the big stages, the big players respond, and it's Seiken with the godlike shuffle. But this might not be the Baron. There's no, no smite available. 113 is dead. They have to secure it. You have to shock blast as well. That's a lot of Curtain damage. Call. And no one's cleared the warden yet. There he finally goes through. Curtain, Curtain call. call. No, no, They're no, gonna no. go Don't for it. He's gonna try and make it. The burst comes in. Gonna get the last oh. one. Pantera! Get hero. down, Mr. President! He sacrifices his life so that the benefit of the team can get the Baron. Live on for me. Live on without me. Go on. Win this game. Take the Baron. I'll gladly sacrifice my life for it. Hantara, monstrous performance once again on the Rakan. Not that just someone else could have blocked it for him, but he sees that bullet through, flying through the air and he takes the decision to at least secure that one. And he gets so close. And the engage range from Kami Corp becoming such a problem for LDLC. Again, they don't have the Jin here. They don't have <gasps> that. They don't have that champion, which can help them in the longer range fights. Maybe slow someone down. Maybe put some traps down. Hit a W and Saken pounces. And Hantara, you know, so quick with that quickness as well, getting over the wall with the grand entrance it's there. It's in the name. It really is. And then Ragnar, I mean, they're left to try and poke out the Baron away. I really would have loved to see Hantara die again, but it seems like die, he's got other plans for this one. They've got other plans because 113 is coming in here and he's oh, got some friends as well. It's going to be a full 5v5. The TP is going to be coming in. They're going to get taken, jumping in on top of it. The bullet time is good. Exa King is no longer part of this team fight. As you can see, Kabochar taking out Yike as well. It's a two for nothing. They will trade it back. You can see Ike trying to make something work for Carmen. Corp are just wiping the floor with LDLC. They see fight, they take fight, and they take advantage. And they have themselves power spikes, and they are being so decisive about using them. This isn't just seeing every fight and taking it. They're also seeing the right fights, too. They can end the game. I don't know if they can end the game, but they can get so much off of this right now. Look at all the wave states. Top, mid, bot. They're all being pushed in by the side of Carmen Corp's minions. So you have so many options available to you. Thank you so much, Goldberg, because... You didn't set up anything as LDLC. You went back to try and find something and it just backfired. And it felt like they realized they were caught out and they just had to all in. They said, like, we're, we're going to go towards these teleports. Let's see if we can take a fight. But it isn't the kind of fight that they want. It feels like LDLC were the ones getting a bit desperate there. They took a multi-angle fight. The Yumi can't help with that. The Jin's not peeled for. Everything goes wrong for them. And LDLC's composition, it is the harder composition to pilot as well. Like, Very if you make so. one, make, we, we said this the entire game so far. One misstep, you die. And that's why I hate as well at times is because like you have human error you had times where it will falter and you know in the late game where you get a standoff so many times around the baron or around the elder drake as we've seen already so many times in this series one guy will make a mistake or one guy will falter to the mobility coming through from the engage of either hantara Sagan, cabochard it's just so difficult to deal with of a uh, in, in kagov's composition cabo has the mega has flash looking for something he's gonna go try and find yike but he gets himself out with the crescent guard so that just kind of stops your defense now in the mid lane so the base shall be broken open. This Baron power play above five and a half thousand. This is becoming a monster snowball running down to the chalets and it's going to destroy everything. And just a reminder, Carmine Corp couldn't even get a single game off of LDLC in their LFL playoffs. They went 0-3 against them in their own series versus them. And then they couldn't even get to reface them in the finals. They were taken down in that lower bracket. They get one more chance to take them down on that even bigger stage, and they are flourishing right now. Even talking to Saken just a couple days ago, you know, he was talking about, like, facing LDLC again. He was pretty sure that not only as a team, they had evolved themselves, but they only they also had a really good read on what LDLC wants to do. This time around with kind of this team fighting coming through, this kind of evolution of them that we saw against Vitality B as well, with the Asir forsaking, the long-range carry, it's really just like wonders on them, and it just keeps, you know, speaking that story as well when we watch to play. This is just them pushing forward. Like, how do you get rid of this? You have to invest in 
curtain call to try and make this one work for your team. Antera will get rooted up, will have the quickness, and they're using an awful lot to try and kill off a Rakan right now. This isn't really going to work out for you because when the Crescent Guard goes down, you're going to be forced to flash away. I like the idea from LDLC, but like you guys said earlier, it's a little bit desperate. And a lot of it might have been wondering whether they could get a chase recalling, getting out with the home guards to get towards that fight. They had to say themselves a very risky 1v1 there, which is starting to go, well, not even starting, it's continuing to go a little bit poorly for Ragnar. Not able to really punish Kabashar when he's in Neganar's state, and now Kabashar's starting to put the hurt down even more in a lane, which he died four times early in. For Carmine Corp, this is your game to lose. So where do you want to see these guys go, Goldberg? How do you want to see them finish off this game? Because there's something that we have to give a little bit of criticism to Dakarmin Corp. They can get a little bit fun in their later stages if they feel like they're ahead. I feel like at this point, you can open up the map if you want to. There's one minute for the for the Baron, right? Kabashot, he's got that teleport. You keep him in the bottom side. You can have one member in the mid lane to escort these uh, super minions in, apply the extra pressure to the side of LDLC, and then you just group around the top side, so it's really easy to just back and default on towards the Baron afterwards. I also feel like 1-1-3 one, one, can just sit there and look to blow flashes. Just look to take away summoner spells, look to take away crescent guards, because you're at the point now now, where this Jarvan oh, is really tanky. It's not easy to turn it immediately around onto this guy. If you're going to, if you are further behind, maybe the Jarvan gets popped. Not the case. 1-1-3, I want to see him get, make some of those more risky plays. Try and take away some summoners. I love how they've kept those two pink wards yeah, in know, that right? brush. They've just been like, no. Send a message. We know <laughs> that we ha they have no vision here and we can play around. And honestly, it's exactly what they're doing. Like you said, 1-1-3 is playing to blow flashes. He's just sitting in the fog of war saying, you can't see me, which means you have to stay in your base. To be fair, that's an incredibly annoying bush. If you place a pink ward on the left side, then the far right yeah. side of the bush will actually not reveal the wards, but fight's happening! Here we go. We're going to try and see them go for this one here. They do get the Cataclysm out. Kavashar is TPing in. As the curtain call comes out, Kavashar goes into Mega. They still need to take down this turret, and they will do so. So, second inhibitor turret has been taken. There is one inhibitor down, another one exposed. You have the Shreema's legacy to back you up here as Carmine Corp. You can't get too frisky with this one here. They need to make sure that they don't give any opportunities left over to LDLC, and they're going to back away. But they still have such a margin of error to work with. The Jin is not doing much damage. I mean, Jin is not a high damage AD carry as far as they go, scaling to the late game. The LeBlanc has to deal with an Anathema's chain on the other side, reducing a lot of damage, a lot of tanks. You really are waiting on Shock Blast, but the Jace is even held in a side lane. LDLC, so few options. And can we just prove a point while the resets are coming through? What's the goal discrepancy between these two AD carries? I'd really love to see that as well, just to really put into perspective of how Ooh. difficult the matchup is. Yeah, oh my I mean, God. that's what you get for blind picking Jin and Yumi. I'm honestly not even sad about it because <laughs> it's so unplayable <laughs> when you pick it into a misfortune that you know Reckless love playing as well. And I think. That could have been way worse as well. K-Cop didn't even play around this lane, but now in the team fights, it's such a weak point that's so easy to attack. And what did you get for that blind pick? You got a counter pick in top lane, which is even in gold. You started off well, that's not really led to anything after this point, and now you look Abo. at Kavashan, he's so aggressive. He has to be, because he knows how strong he can be. They are going to get a little bit of damage down, but Hantera can join in. The bullet time is good, Ike gets onto the backside. Hantera just about stays alive. Yike, however, is not so lucky, and Kavoshard sees that all the ultimates oh! are gone! And Saken, once again, sweeps up the competition, and Carmine Corp can't put a foot wrong. Higher in editor, he's already made multiple montages playing this one specifically, and now they could just look for the end. 31 minutes into the game, finally with a mid lane wave coming in here. It's a cannon wave, no supers, but they should have it in them. And Carmine Corp looking to take a lead, undefeated till this point. Carmine Corp looking to take a second. One more step to a historic three-peat of Amazon EU Masters Championships. <sighs> Carmine Corp, they're just getting better and better. I mean, they, they, it's what we said, they're the kind of team that evolves in a series. They're the only team who really pushes forward. Remember, LDLC... Adaptability. Exactly. Yeah. But LDLC, they never lost a game in this tournament. They don't know how it feels to lose in this best of five. They necessarily don't have the proper tools to react to what came through. They adapted in this series, but they adapted with something that really didn't work into what k -Cop had functioning for them. And it feels like that series of Vitality B really just set this team on fire. It really just gave them that extra kind of push. It's oh, like, yeah. oh, heck, we got this close to being knocked out, this close from yep. having our third title stolen from us. Let's go make sure we go get it then, huh? Yeah, and I think that's going to be... Pretty damn damning to see what LDLC can do. They're now, for the first time, pretty much the entire EU Masters on the back foot. We are going to send it to a break, though. When we return, we will have Medic and our lovely analysts to break down what could be our second last game.
systems are overloading. We can't risk another game. We need to take a break and regroup. We're starting to lose our mind. Captain, we cannot go back to Elo Helm. Last time it took us months to get out of it. Initiate break protocol. Hurry up! Yes! Yes! I did it! I, we did it!